right because it's uh, a new one temporarily so i was afraid that some people haven't got it who sent me that Jimpa, there you are. Yes, hello, yes. Did you did you get the link from my WhatsApp message or what? Uh, I had I had a, a few mails from Jason, and oh. uh, I I clicked on the wrong one. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's the confusion. You see, I'm worried that people didn't know it's a special temporary new um, link this week, just for this week. He's on some business call this this evening or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm just afraid people like Jan or somebody that haven't got it. But what can I do? I can't WhatsApp Jan, can I? Chris Kenyon, see, he always joins. I got the link because I received um, a reminder that, that popped to my, upon my computer screen. And in that, there was the correct link. The reminder that comes up just before the class. Yeah, you have the mm. correct link in there. Well, yeah, uh, you know, um, I mentioned that to Jason that there was this there was this issue, but yeah, he's done his best by sending an email. But maybe it was a bit late. He sent the email only this evening, a few minutes before after seven or something, and not everybody might have got it, but. Yeah, if, if there's other ways they could have got it by the way Jim put and Tim got it through different means. So we just have to work. I with got that. the email five days ago. Yeah, but the one that was sent earlier, it tells you that's the link. And then underneath it says, this is the temporary link for Thursday or something. So the first link you see isn't isn't the right one I, I got. That was my impression. And then you had to go down the email. And then there was the other link, which was the temporary one for today which Jim managed to see kind of second time, you know, second time lucky sort of thing. But you are on the ball marker, you see. You didn't mess about, you got it all right. Good evening, Francois. Hello, Gisela. Sorry, I got uh, mistaken with the link. Yes, you see, sorry, we've been discussing that. We've been worrying about that. It's been okay. wasted five minutes already. Um, where are you in France? In in in, in Cosme, Saint Cosme, Envery? Yes, that's where I am at the moment. So yeah. you get a good enough signal there. That's great. Yeah, yeah, we have a new uh, yeah network, so it's it's pretty good. Now. A new one. So you're in the office, are you or something? Yes, on the office. Yeah, welcome. Okay, well let's get started then. So we're on the. Um, Third type of correct sign, which is correct non-observation sign. So we just um, did a general kind of presentation of that last week. Although it's the third kind of correct sign, there's still only two ways that the um, the sign relates to the um, predicate. You know, it's either got to be a relation of effect or cause, subsequently related, or it's got to be a relation of the same nature. It is related to the same nature as that, and that is. Um, correct notice sign and uh, correct uh, non-observation sign. Both of them can come in that category. Hi, Jan. Sorry, Hi, sorry. Any... sorry, I joined a bit late. <clears throat> yeah, you got the right link anyway, good. Yeah, so um, all the correct uh, non-observation signs, in fact, the, the sign will be related as, you know, related to the same nature to the predicate, just as the um, correct nature signs. I mean, they're split apart for the reason that correct nature signs, you know, the correct non-observation signs, uh, you know, the, 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 the key kind of thing you're realizing is emptiness, so a very important subject. And that's kind of, you know, uh, the predicate will be uh, negative. So that will be a correct non-observation sign. So it kind of deserves a treatment all on its own because it's 
it's kind of you know the 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 very important reasoning which has got this negative feature yeah so what was the definition um reading from page 19 in the middle correct non-observation signs just to review uh, the definition at the top uh, in the middle there it is a correct sign in the proof of that and also there exists a common base of being the explicit predicate of the probandum in the proof of that by the sign of it and being a negative phenomena so the predicate of the probandum has got to be negative the sign doesn't have to be negative you know the subject um, uh, you know susan she is not um, self-sufficient substantially existent person because she is dependent on rising or so whatever it is you know the sign doesn't have to be negative it's the predicate of the rabandon that has to be negative the sign can be negative but that's uh, not, all, not altogether necessary yeah i'm not sure if that was a correct sign the one i just gave but anyway you get the picture and now we ought to go on to the division don't we unless you've got any sort of special questions so before you know the um there's a two, division into two then now um So the division into two means that the two are if divided with respect to the second if divided there are two correct non-observation sign for the non-appearing and correct non-observation sign for the suitable to appear. So the all the signs that I know about emptiness will be in the second category. You know, correct non-observation sign for the suitable to appear. So if something were inherently existent, it would be suitable to appear as inherently existent. Of course, if inherently existent doesn't inherent existence doesn't appear. I mean, inherent existence doesn't exist, but it can certainly appear even if it's not existent. So it's um those signs are non-observation signs for the suitable to appear. And that refers to the, the predicate of the pravandam or the, you know, the, the kind of um, the object that the predicate of the pravandam is dealing with. But the first we're going to look at these non-observation signs for the non-appearing. So these are a bit more, a bit more kind of, you know, um, um, not central, like to, not central to the path, like realizing impermanence or realizing uh, emptiness. But they're not entirely like they're not entirely uh, uh, just um, incidental, because when you know when we when we see somebody and we judge them to be you know good person or bad person, <clears throat> we sometimes remember reminded that everybody could be a bodhisattva. It doesn't mean that bodhisattvas have to be wearing jewels or you know, um, kind of dressed in robes or um, you know looking like they've got um, blissed out. Uh, consciousness or kind eyes you know the bodhisattva could be appearing in all sorts of you know in just very ordinary ways and for a person like us it's, it's still impossible to say is that person a bodhisattva or not you know those good qualities um don't appear to our consciousness because um, you know we aren't refined enough to be able to um kind of you know make the distinction so it reminds us to teach to you know not to judge people just on the basis of their appearance because what they're like inside could be actually very different from the way they're appearing to our, you know, mind full of, uh, you know, ignorance or affliction. So there is there is that point to it, and uh, we might um, sort of um, might get an explanation of that um, at a certain point, but not right now. So we'll try and look at the um, the signs as they appear. Uh, right now, which is not talking about bodhisattvas at all, but something else. So we'll look at that first. And then I've got a little explanatory, you know, translation bit, which I can send to you. I won't do that just yet. Um, I could have sent it earlier, but I was a bit busy this afternoon, so I forgot to send it. But um, that might thing, make things a bit clearer when we when we get to read through that. Because this is a bit wacky and it's a bit, um, the signs you'll find are a bit complicated to uh, to work out if you're unfamiliar with them. Eventually they start to make sense, but maybe not right at the beginning. Anyway, we, we'll uh, we'll go through them and just see how, it, see how it goes. So 
So normally, of course, you know, we would read first with, this, with respect to the first, again, there are two definitions and divisions. Um, so then we do the definition and then we go to the, def uh, then we go to the divisions. But um, the definitions here are a bit complicated. They uh, provide good debate. So we, I remember there being a lot of debate on these, uh, on this little group. And, uh, you know, it, it, they are devised by Dharmakirti, you know, so he, they're taken from his um, Ramanavati, his um, commentary of recognition. So, uh, you know, they've got a good um, authentic source to them. Uh, but uh, instead of that, I think if we go to look at a couple of the examples first, you know, they might be easy to understand. And we look at the examples, and then we can go to the definition, okay? So we have the the, the um, division, uh, sorry, the, um, the definition of the main one. And then we have divisions. And uh, then there are some, yeah. So then you, you get you get sort of uh, more divisions and more definitions before you before you get to a uh, an example. So I want to start at the example. So let's look at the bottom of page twenty, where it says the first at the time of stating. Last paragraph on page twenty, not the note, but um, the last paragraph. So this is an example of a um, correct sign for the non-appearing. So there's divisions of those, never mind which division it fits into at this stage. But just try to, um, you know, make what you can of the actual example. So uh, I'm going to read uh, the last paragraph on page 20. The first, at the time of stating the subject here in the place in front. With regard to a flesh eater, a person for whom a flesh eater is beyond his ken does not develop a factually concordant subsequent cognizer ascertaining the existence of a flesh eater because, with regard to a flesh eater, a person for whom a flesh eater is beyond his ken does not observe a flesh eater with a valid cognizer. That, for instance. Yeah, so that's cool, isn't it? Um, well, I'll just explain a bit myself and then we can go to the document which has got the explanatory um, bits in it from, from the uh, Institute of Buddhist Dialectics debating book. But uh, maybe I'll just try and explain a bit first. So we're talking about flesh eater. So what the heck's that? It's some sort of cannibal demon, right? And um, I don't know that, you know, it comes from India. I guess this come Dharmakirti, so they were... Maybe they were, they were common in Dharmakirti's day, just hanging around in the forest, all these cannibal flesh-eating demons just waiting to eat you up if they find you in the forest at night or something. Uh, we may be not so familiar with them. It's maybe they've, uh, they haven't kind of spread to our part of the world. Uh, you know, it's a sort of a rare species or something. But um, it's not the point that they don't do they exist or not. I think um, the uh, our own system is that they do exist. It's just that you know they're difficult to see because um, they don't just appear to your ordinary eye consciousness like an ordinary dog or cat or a person. So uh, it's not that they don't exist. Somehow that's not the, that's not the basis. Of, that's not the part of the argument. They're accepted to exist, but they're like um you know beyond our ken in the sense that they have subtle bodies or something or you know they're not so sort of gross gross um uh people who just appear to your eye consciousness your ordinary eye consciousness like um like we do i mean you'd think if they ate flesh that they would do that you think if they ate flesh if they gobbled you up you know tore you apart and gobbled, gobbled you up you'd think they would have gross bodies why else would they be eating flesh because they have a gross body to they need to feed, you know, but 
Uh, apparently not. They eat you, you eat you up, but how the flesh gets digested, I don't know. It doesn't result, it doesn't result, result in them having a gross body made of flesh that anybody can see very easily. Something karmic maybe in it. You know, maybe they do have a gross body. We just can't see the gross body because they're on some slightly different dimension or something. They can grab us and eat us, but we can't quite see them or something. Ordinary beings, yeah. So, you ask us, is there a flesh eater in this room, you know? We wouldn't say, we wouldn't know what to say. If there was one, we wouldn't be able to see it because they don't appear to, you know, our ordinary sense consciousness of an ordinary being. And if there isn't one, you know, if there wasn't one, then we couldn't, we couldn't uh, verify that either. We couldn't identify that with, with the uh, value cognition. You know, if you ask, is there a horse in this room we're sitting in now? You know, we can definitely say there isn't a horse. You know, it's just so big, we'd, we'd be very obvious. So we can we can identify if there's no horse, we could, we'd identify with valid recognition there is no horse. So either way, whether the horse was here, we could exist and we, we would see it and have a valid recognizer knowing it. And if it wasn't here, we would have valid recognizer knowing it's, it's non-existence. Because this room, you know, there's only limited places where the horse could be and none of them are really big enough for a horse to hide in, you know, so it would have to be right in front of our eyes and getting in the way. But the flesh eaters is just the opposite, you know. It can be here, but we wouldn't know it because we can't see them properly. Uh, but and if they're not here, we don't know that either because, um, you know, there's no no kind of it's a sort of um, way of telling that, they don't, that there isn't one here. There's no kind of um, correct um, way of um, understanding that. Whether it is a direct perception or even just uh, proving it with a valid cognition. Some, some sort of burst person with a very refined type of sight or special clairvoyance, maybe they could see them or see their absence. And maybe we could believe them, you know, that we could do it as some sort of, um, depending on somebody else's uh, identification. But as far as we're concerned, you know, just, just for we're using our own resources, then we, it's impossible for us to generate a valakonizer either way. Okay, so that's the whole point. Uh, just like as I was saying with the with the um, the person's good qualities or bad qualities, you know, we can't say that person doesn't have any good qualities, or that we can't say that person's not a bodhisattva because even if he was a bodhisattva, we wouldn't be able to tell either way just by looking at him, you know, and, and just by having a casual, casual conversation. So I'll read the sign again then, and just comment in those in those terms. First, at the time of stating the subject. Here in the place in front, so that's just like you know, the subject is a place, just like on the smoke. Is there fire or not? So here in this place, the place in front, whether you say it's this room or wherever we were, you know, wherever you put us on top of a mountain in a forest, the place wouldn't make much difference. Still, the flesh eater would be, you know, impossible for us to see. So it didn't really. You don't have to specify on the smoky passage like any place you care to mention. The place, there's no special place where the flesh eater is easier to see than any other place, as far as we're concerned. So, here in the place in front, we'll do then as a subject. With regard to a flesh eater, a person of whom a flesh eater is beyond his ken, so that's us. Well, me, I mean, maybe you've seen them, I don't know, um, the ordinary person. Uh, so, beyond his ken, his means whether it is a, a direct perception, a, a, an eye consciousness, for instance, or it is um, um, an inferential valid recognizer. Neither of them will work for us. So that's what it means. And it doesn't mean just beyond his sense consciousness. It means beyond any power of him to, to know it, except unless you know he believes the Buddha who tells him and then it becomes some sort of correct sign of belief or something. But just... You know, um, on his own um, inferential investigation or looking with his, uh, you know, sense consciousness, you won't get, uh, um, you won't recognize one. Just to mention that um, Catherine Rogers translates this as supersensory, as if, you know, if this, the flesh eater is supersensory, like it's beyond your sense consciousness, you know, beyond your, beyond your direct perception. Um, to see one, to have one, you know, to know one is there, but it's also beyond your inference. 
but you can, you know, maybe you could debate that. You say, well, you could believe a Buddha. Uh, he says there's one here, then you believe him because he's a, he's an infallible being, and you know he's a, you, you're confident he's an infallible being, so you can have a correct sign of belief or something. So that that does come into here, in this in this um, in this uh, uh, chapter, you know. Correct sign of belief. What is that all about? Yeah. So. Um, if you studied a bit of uh, Lorig, maybe you've come across correct sign of belief. But when we divide correct signs again, it will come up in this text too. But when we did debate it, that came up here, you know. Um, correct sign of belief. So what does that entail, you know? Anyway, we'll come to that in, in due course, not right now. So it's beyond your ken. I can't think of any other way of saying that. It's beyond your power of observation. It's beyond your power of recognition. So beyond his ken, I mean, it just means beyond his knowledge, right? So I don't know if that's a familiar enough uh, English word for you, but that's what it means, beyond your power of um, understanding, beyond your power of knowing on your own. So the flesh eater is beyond his ken, right? So that kind of person, just like us, ordinary person, okay, they exist. It's not, they're not the question that we don't know whether they exist or not. They're like a ghost. Well, does, is there such a thing as a ghost or not? We could argue about that. We don't know. Somebody say, well, they don't exist. Yeah. Mm, but uh, in this case, that's not the argument. You know, they, they, they basically accept that they do exist, but they're beyond your ken. So that sort of person, then he cannot develop a factually concordant subsequent cognizer ascertaining the existence of a flesh eater, because with regard to that flesh eater, a person of whom the flesh eater is beyond his ken does not observe flesh eater with a valid cognizer. So, um, when you come to the, the other type of correct non-observation sign, for the suitable to appear, you know, then that's kind of, you know, there's, there's um, if it were there, we'd see it, you know. But it's not there, and then there's a, there's a proof, why it isn't there? And so we know it's not there. And so we have a we can have a develop a you know a valid cognizer ascertaining its non-existence in that place through reasoning. But here it's slightly different. You can't you can't tell either way. So it's just a kind of a quirky type of um, non-observation sign where you can't tell whether it's there or whether it's not there. All you can do is make some sort of you know convoluted sign where you say, oh well, there's no subsequent cognizer observing it in that person's continuum, because there's no valid cognizer observing it in that person's continuum. So I hope that makes some kind of sense. You know, it's not like, um, as I say, earth shattering and, and you know, completely like a, a revelation of a new meaning of life or something. Um, but it is, it is, you know, that, that, that thing about, you know, you, you, you can't observe some, you can't sort of pretend that you you can dismiss somebody as having no good qualities or whatever just because they look stupid. Um, you know, the, the appearance uh, of a person and whether he's got good qualities or not are two different things. You know, the good qualities don't necessarily appear on the surface. So yeah, there is there is some point to to a, a sort of sort of meaning in a Dharma sense, but that's about it. So let's just try another one, which is very similar. We won't go through all the examples. Um, but there aren't, I think there's only, yeah, well, there are more examples, but they're, they're, not, they're not wildly different from each other. I oh, know that's um, correct non observation sign then. Yeah, so there are, there are three examples actually all together, but they're all on the flesh eater theme. So maybe we can look at another example now. So at the top of page 21, it says second at the time of stating. Okay. Second at the time of stating, the subject here in the place in front, with regard to a flesh eater, it is not correct for a person for whom a flesh eater is beyond his ken to assert that a flesh eater exists because with regard to a flesh eater, a person for whom a flesh eater is beyond his ken does not observe a flesh eater with a valid cognizer. So the, the reasoning is the same, the sign is the same, but just what it's proving is, um, 
is a bit different. No valid cognizer, then no subject organizer. That was the first one, right? Here, because there's no valid cognizer, then it's not suitable for that person who cannot generate a valid cognizer. It's not, it's not uh, suitable for that person to say, uh, there's a flesh eater that exists here. The flesh, there's a flesh eater in this room. Because, you know, that, that person doesn't have a valid cognizer uh, ascertaining flesh eater because flesh eater is beyond his ken, yeah? So the reasoning is the same, but it's just a different conclusion. Um, so, uh, you know, one is actually like um, a cause and effect thing, yeah? Because the, uh, you know, because the cause, the valid cognizer isn't seen, isn't, isn't, isn't there, then the effect of that cause, the subsequent cognizer can't be there either. So there's no cause, then they're going to have the effect type of thing. But the first, uh, but the second one is um, not not the same, quite the same relationship. One is a pervader; one pervades the other. Yeah? So it's not because there is no cause, there's no effect. If it's because there's no pervader, then there's no pervader. Uh, type of argument. Yeah, so you, you, you get the idea with, um, you know, yeah, if that kind of person doesn't have a valid cognizer of a flesh eater, you know, how does he know whether there's a flesh eater here or not? So then how can he say whether the flesh eater exists here? You know, it's not that he can say that, but it's not not um, not reliable. So it's not suitable for, you know, to to accept that. Because, uh, you know, he's not the right person to, to, not, to know. Okay, well, there's two examples, you see, so. Um, uh, deeply, uh, deeply kind of, um, uh, whatever, thought-provoking, maybe. So now we can perhaps go to um, the definition. May I ask? Yeah. What is a period and what is not a period? I don't understand what the difference between these three terms. Well, they're both um, correct native signs for the non-appearing. Sorry, correct non-observation signs for the non-appearing. No. They're both non-appearing. We're, we're still in the first section, right? Mm -hmm. The correct native sign for the suitable to appear, that that's starts you know a bit lower down the page 21. Um, so we've got, I said, there's three examples of the correct uh, non-observation non sign for the non-appearing. And we've just done two of them. So now I'm going back to the definition. So, yeah, non-appearing. I mean, there is somebody who has a valid recognizer of it. You know, Buddha has a valid recognizer. He knows whether there's a flesh eater in this room or not. But for the person who's like the, the opponent in the debate, you know, the um, correct uh, opponent or something, you know, or, or you know, the, 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 the person that's mentioned in the sign, should I say that's better, the person who's mentioned in the sign, then it's beyond his understanding. So it doesn't appear to him. It doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't appear in general. It can appear to the very highly, you know, clairvoyant beings. But it doesn't appear to, to to the person who's you know thinking about it in the in the sign. Mm -hmm. That's quite nice question. So I had, I had this thought also about this uh, inferential valid cognizer through the power of belief. Mm. So um, <clears throat> because the, let's say the flesh eater doesn't appear to pause uh, 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 in the direct perception. See it, yeah. So, <clears throat> well, let's say I have a um, an inferential by the cognition by the power of belief, because you said the Buddha's told me. But still, that flesh eater won't appear. Well, it's like the fire on this on on the Smoky Pass, isn't it? You know, you can prove that the the fire exists on the smoky pass because there's because there's smoke there. So it doesn't mean you see the fire, but you know it's there by inferential valid cognition 
you know, on the smoky pass, it follows there is fire because there is smoke. So the fire will appear, it won't appear to your direct perception, but it appears to your, you know, conceptual consciousness through the meaning of the generality of fire. But isn't, for, for <coughs> that to be a correct sign, isn't it follow that uh, prior to that, prior to uh, Paul having the inferential uh, cognition that fire exists by the sign smoke, Paul's had a, <coughs> a direct realisation, he's directly perceived fire. Mm. And so on that basis, you know, I can have the inferential fire cognition based on the sign smoke. But with the flesh eater, there's no initial direct perception of the flesh eater. Yeah, so it is different. But yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're from business familiar with fire, and then somebody says, oh, there's fire on top of the hill then because of smoke. Yeah, then if you, you understand it's a correct sign, then you have this, you know, mental, uh, you know, conceptual cognition, which is an inferential valley cognizer, that there is fire on, 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 you know, on the top of the hill, top of the pass. But you don't, it doesn't appear to your eye consciousness, but you have this, you know, proper appearance to your, um, correct appearance to your um, inferential valley cognizer. So you can say, yes, you realize fire, it appears to that inferential Balakonizer through the uh, meaning generality. But you have to remember that there are people, you know, when you first see a hidden phenomena, then you don't have any prior um, realization of it until you, you realize it by means of that sign. You know, like um, something like inherent existence, lack of inherent existence, or, you know, impermanence, subtle impermanence. You don't realize subtle impermanence until. You realize sound is, imper sound is impermanent. Yeah? You only realize subtle impermanence for the first time, independence upon their correct sign. So you don't have a prior knowledge of mm -hmm. subtle impermanence before you realize it with that sign. But still, you know, you can realize it. So it doesn't have you don't have to have had that sort of direct realization of the of fire somewhere else, in the sense that you know, if you're talking about subtle impermanence. Yeah, but the correct sign of belief, you see, that's um, that's um, I don't know where that comes up now. Anyway, it came up quite strongly in this thing, so let's let's wait until it comes up. But uh, yeah, the only way you could have a correct sign realizing the place it would be like that, I think. And even then, I'm not sure. Well, I believe because the Buddha says so. I mean, is that a correct sign? It's true because the Buddha says so, you know. It's got the inferential valley and nice with belief, you know. Is that would that be enough for us? Yeah, we might be willing to believe, you know. But is it the correct sign? You know, if my father says so, a child would would tell say that, wouldn't they? You know? Well, so and so and so is true because my father says so. And he believes it because, you know, he believes his father, but it's not exactly a correct sign to convince another kid, is it? So what does it mean, the correct sign of belief? is? It's not just simply believing, it's somebody inferential of other organizer, all the same. Anyway, that's, um, we haven't kind of, it hasn't sort of, it, it does, it will come up somewhere. So we're going to read the um, the actual definition now, which is really hardcore. <laughs> um, the first, it is a correct. I'm reading from the bottom of page 19. So this is the, the division of non-appearing uh, correct. Um, what is it? The definition of correct non-observation sign for the non-appearing in general. So we've had the correct sign for the uh, correct non-observation sign definition. That just means the correct sign and the predicate of the Ravanzam and the Gandham. But on top of that, correct non-observation sign for the non-appearing. So the bottom of page 19. First, uh, it is a correct non-observation sign in the proof of the non-engagement non of a factually concordant subsequent cognizer ascertaining the 
existence of a flesh eater in the place in front by the person for whom, with respect to flesh eaters, a flesh eater is beyond its ken, and the object designated as a predicate of the Prabandam in the proof of that by the sign of it being existent, the object designated as a, as a predicate of the Namandam in the proof of that by the sign of it is not suitable to appear to a valid cognizer uh, of the person for whom it has become the property of the subject in the proof of that on the flawless subject sought to be known in the proof of that by the sign of it. So that's what Dharmakirti dreamed up. Yeah, so you'd have a nice time uh, trying to memorize that one. Take you about take you about three weeks. Just memorizing the definition. Now I'm working out what he's trying to say. Okay, so you know whatever we're talking about, this is obviously on a basis. It's not you know this is a correct sign. Uh, with regard to the flesh eater and all that trip. So it's, it's not the general definition, it's the definition on a particular basis. Yeah. But then, anyway, you know, whatever we're trying to prove, it has to be a correct non-observation sign in the proof of that. Yeah. So that's like the number one, it has to be a correct non-observation sign in the proof of that. And on top of that, what is it going to be true? Well, Difficult to generalize because they just want to give it to you on a on a um, on, on a specific example. So what are we talking about? It's saying there's no factually concordant uh, subsequent cognizer. So this is the guy who we're talking about, the guy who's you know observing the place in front, and you ask him, you know, is there a, is there a flesh eater in this place or not? So he starts to wonder about that. So then, you know, you can say, what, all you can say about that person is that he won't have a factually concordant subsequent cognizer of a flesh eater in that place because he won't have a valid cognizer of the flesh eater in that place. So, um, so what are the parameters, you know, what, what are the, um, what's the definition, what's the definition going to, you know, help us with and what's it going to exclude as, as a non-appearing sign? Well, we all know that it's um, a correct non-observation sign in the proof of the non-engagement of a factually concordant subsequent cognizer ascertaining the existence of a flesh eater in the place in front. Yeah. Well, if it's a subsequent cognizer, it should be factually concordant, surely. So I don't think you, if you don't have to worry about factually concordant, because if it's a subsequent cognizer, it's, it realizes it's a subject, right? So it's got to be factually concordant, surely. So that's, that's a kind of a bit of a safe an extra sort of um, safety safety measure to say factually concordant, because if it is a subsequent cognizer, it should automatically be factually concordant, surely. And it's a subsequent cognizer of what? Well, um, if it were there, it would be engaging or ascertaining the existence of the flesh eater in the place in front. But there is no such factually concordant con con cognizer because the person who we're talking about with respect to flesh eaters in the, in the place in front, or in, fact, in in respect to flesh eaters in general, you know they're beyond his power of understanding. They're beyond his ken. So he's not going to have a factually concordant uh, sub subsequent neither of them, because um, you know he just can't tell whether they're there or not anyway. So that's um, it's got to be a correct non-observation sign in the proof of that. And uh, now this is the sort of the the. Um, I say the, the, the unique bit which, which separates, it, separates it out from the other type of non-observation sign, the suitable to appear. So here it says the object designated as a predicate of the Prabhanda and the proof of that by the sign of it being existent. So even though it does exist, so nobody's arguing that maybe flesh eaters don't exist, it does exist in general. But the object designated as a predicate of the Prabhanda, which is flesh eater, you know, predicate of the Nagandam in the proof of that, sorry. By the sign of it is not suitable to appear. So the flesh eater is not suitable to appear to that uh, guy's fellow cognizer, to the person for whom it has become the property of the subject. So he's realized the you know the sign on the subject. Yeah, so he's realized the sign on the subject, but he can't, you know, still nevertheless, this flesh eater not suitable to um, kind of appear to his fellow cognizer. So therefore he can't have a subsequent cognizer of it. 
but that's that's the key thing. Yeah, that the the, the the this object we're talking about, the flesh eater, is not suitable to appear, either to his uh, direct perception or his uh, influence. So you can have little arguments about it, little make little um, influences, but you're limited as what you can do. There's no subsequent recognizer because there's no valid recognizer, you know. And it's not suitable to say he'd exist in this place because he hasn't had a valid recognizer of it existing in this place. And he, he can't have an avalicanizer, you know, no, it doesn't exist in this place either. So these are the sort of slight kind of things you can say uh, in this situation. So maybe we should go to this um, other document that uh, was prepared that I just checked through. So I've got to be able to put this somewhere in chat. I don't know if it's, it's not too big to go in chat. Can I just drop the document into, into chat, Thomas? Yeah, you should be able to just drag it into the chat box. Okay, well, I've got the chat box open. So you have to drag it in the chat box when it's open or closed, the document? Open, yeah. Open. Uh, <clears throat> the document is closed. I think you just pick, take the icon and drag it in. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Got to think where the document is. Uh, downloads maybe. Okay, I'll try. It's still in downloads. Dropbox, I suppose. I click Dropbox. Um, hold on. Um, TP translation 69 to 71, so it's called, sent successfully. So look for that in your chat. TP is Tented Palmo, the famous nun. You're not on Zoom. Why, why aren't you on Zoom? Because I don't have a link. Because? I don't have a link. I'm not. I'm not. What kind of send you the document by? What's it called? No, that Apple thing. What do they call it? Yeah. Oh, Airdrop. Overdrive or something. Airdrop. Airdrop yeah. yeah. They send it by email also. Not does it straight to you? Can you send it to him? Yeah. Then I won't have to bother. Yeah. yeah, I can concentrate on what I'm supposed to be doing. Have you got that document, chaps? Have yes. You, have you got it? All good. Thank you. Have you got it, Jacob? Jacob. Okay, Yael. I have. What program do I need to open it? No, it cannot open. Yes, uh, You'll need to why. send a PDF. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, I cannot it's, open it. It's a pages document. If you haven't got Apple, it won't work. Yeah, I haven't got Apple. Yeah, me neither. Yeah, I've converted to a PDF. You know, this is all at the last minute today. We've had some um, serious goings on here. There's certain people, so got involved in different things. Okay. I'll make it a PDF quickly. Yeah, we had some problems today. All one problem.
So where's my chat box then? Yeah. Hmm, where's this saved it? Oh, desktop, desktop, desktop. So this should be PDF now. Send successfully. How's that? Okay, Yael? Yep, can open it now. Yeah, me too. Thank you, I've got that. Okay, Hanali. Yeah, Hannah has actually done this before. Hannah Lee and um, Jason, one or two people, have actually seen this a bit about flesh eater so before, so it's not quite so weird. They've seen it before. So this is um, not debates, as I say, it's like just. Uh, just you know, clarifying some of these um, terminological terminology, new terminology. It's a bit, it's, it's a bit weird. So if you're all looking at it, so this is from the Institute of Buddhist Dialectics debating book. We just try to make things a bit easier. The uh, low selling um, collector topics is so brief, so old style. Doesn't tell you anything. Just got to debate it all. But here's some few clues then. So a flesh eater is a type of non-human evil spirit. So yeah, there's no, it's not saying does it exist or not. That's just taken to be, you know, for a Tibetan. There are such things as evil spirits or not. So this is one of them. I don't know, there's, there's one type that, you know, they so walking through the woods, you know, they're trying to walk to Nalanda Monastery from South India, so they have to cross a lot of forest. So the flesh eater turns up and, and they look like a very beautiful woman and they offer the, 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 the tired monk a place to stay for the night. And of course, first they seduce the, the, the monk who can't resist her temptations because she's so handsome. And, uh, you know, the monk's tired out of his long journey and, you know, he's um, really kind of uh, vulnerable, let's say. And uh, then, so the, 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 the evil spirit, you know, posing this beautiful woman, first of all, seduces him and has her way with him. So he's broken his, his root vow. And then she turns into this cannibal flesh-eating demon and calls all her friends in. And then they all tear him to pieces and eat him up. <laughs> so... The monk's worst nightmare. He not only gets killed, but he loses his, his root vows first or something. Something like that. Uh, you know, monks always have to be on guard against these things. Uh, anyway, they might be, you know, they probably eat other, other creatures, not just monks. Uh, but they, they're, they're sort of, um, they must like human flesh, let's say. I don't know if you can call them cannibals actually because you know they are humans themselves to be to be a cannibal you'd have to be eating your own species maybe i don't know anyway so the flesh eater is a type of non-human evil spirit um a flesh eater is beyond someone's ken it expresses the fact that they cannot determine and do not know whether a flesh eater is there or not generally being beyond one's ken in terms of one's own mind is of four kinds so I guess these flesh eaters, when they when they seduce the monk, you know, then they do they put on a human appearance as a beautiful woman. So then you can see them. But if then if they're in their ordinary form, you know, their natural form, then we can't see them. Uh, don't know whether they are or not. So there's four types of being beyond one's ken. You see. So beyond one's ken by way of place. So this we can understand. This is quite, um, uh, you know. Um, yeah, quite easy to understand. For example, it says a world and its inhabitants existing in a place very far from away, very far away from oneself, for instance. So there could be a world out there somewhere in the galaxy. 
um, that could be having happiness in some that world. You know, but we wouldn't be able to see them. We can't say whether they're there or not because it's just too far away. And even if you had a very powerful telescope, you went some, you know, somewhere on the other side of the galaxy, and you, know, you wouldn't be able to tell. You wouldn't be able to sort of notice this world and its inhabitants. Maybe it won't be long before we do discover another world with our powerful, you know, scientific instruments. Then the world does have life on it. Um, but you know, here obviously they're talking to people who don't have telescopes and, and fancy kind of um, equipment. But the Buddha could see it, of course, you know, no, no problem for him. Just um, for you who just got ordinary, ordinary eyesight. Beyond one's can, by way of time, for instance, the world and its inhabitants existing many hundred thousands of years ago. Yeah, so this is um, this is getting a bit more like about you know, what what about the, the correct side of belief, yeah. But you know, you can say, well, the dinosaurs, but there's like proof that the dinosaurs existed in the sense of these fossils. People are very good at reconstructing fossils, you know, and and in measuring little bits and, and telling you what the whole animal is like, you know. So uh, maybe we say there is a, um, a an inferential valakonizer like realizing dinosaur amongst the human population of this world. You know, not, not a direct valakonizer, we're only seeing their bones, fossil bones and that, you know. But uh, would we say there is an inference of valakonizer of somebody realizing dinosaur? Yeah, I mean, that's the kind of evidence you would have valakonizer on. I mean, you know, those people are experts in the field, not saying me. But, you know, what's the dividing line? Anyway, the next one, beyond one's ken by the way of entity. For example, subtle particles um, of the four elements and their subtle functions, which become objects beyond one's ken due to their subtle entities, even though they're near to oneself, for instance. So in my hurry, I put, I've translated subtle as very small there, but that's, that's probably um, a bit of a mistake as the the flesh eaters must come in this category, surely, at number three. In the example he gives, yes, it is. The particles of the, of the four elements are very small, and that's why you, can't, you, you don't know if they're there or not. You know, is there some, some gas? I don't know what kind of gas. It would be argon gas or something, you know, or some, some gas. Um, what other gases do we have? Carbon monoxide, you know, how do we know if this is carbon monoxide in this atmosphere now? Carbon dioxide. I mean, we, pretty, we can guess that there is because it's just ordinary human air and we're breathing out. We're supposed to breathe out carbon dioxide, so there should be some in this air. Or some other gas, you know, I don't know, that's, that's um, not related to human activity. Nitrogen or something, you know, there's supposed to be nitrogen in the atmosphere, isn't there? But, how, you know, can we see it? Um, some other gas that's that's not usually in the atmosphere in, in very great quantities. I don't know what other gas could we have. Helium. Helium, yeah. You know, you could release some helium into this into this uh, room. You know, with out of a, a cylinder. I mean, we couldn't tell whether there's any helium or not because we can't smell it. Presumably, it doesn't have any smell. Some of the particles are just so small, so it's beyond our ken. Super, super. Super sensory, but also super, you know, beyond our valid cognition, uh, inferential valid cognition. Okay, we could, if we had some instruments, okay, that might be a different matter. But, you know, just a person sitting here and you ask them, is there any helium in this room? I guess, you know, most people, they wouldn't be able to say. But of course, I think the, um, the flesh eater is, uh, is included in this category. They're subtle in another way. They're subtle, not because they're so small, but they're subtle just because they're like, um, yeah, they don't have gross bodies in, in the natural form, apparently, you know? So they're just like um, bardo beings or something, you know? They might have some kind of body, but, uh, or even spirits, yeah, spirits, evil spirits. So they have some sort of spirit body maybe, but um, it's not the kind of body that we can touch or smell or something. You have to be some sort of clairvoyant person to, to know one is there, right? Like a, what do you call them? 
hungry ghosts maybe they they for us their body, bodies will be very subtle we if there was one in this room we wouldn't be able, really be able to see I mean, they do have they do seem to have very gross bodies don't they because you know they're always hungry and thirsty and like they're, they're all kind of you know fat or their necks are very thin so they have some definite shapes but for us to see one there might be one here but we just can't see it because we're on a different different wavelength you know and we're not tuned in so I think putting very small in there, as I did, just trying to correct uh, the spelling and everything. Uh, that's uh, that's addition is okay for the particles of the four elements, but not 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 in general for the for this number three. So I'm going to cross that out. And the last one beyond their ken by way of number. So, for example, the number of insects existing on in the ground of a place where one is, for instance, you know, there could be you know, an ant's nest nearby. So there's all these ants running all over the floor. So somebody says, how many ants are there? Well, we 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 ought to know. We won't be able to count it. You know, if we tried to count them, it would probably take, you know, the rest of our life to count all the insects or something, because there's so many of them are. Okay, the finite number, but so many that it's not a realistic prospect that we could ever count them. Okay, so that's, that gives you a bit of a better clue what they're talking about beyond your ken, you know. And these are the idea of somebody's um, good qualities, like we're saying the Bodhisattva, don't, you know, never get angry with the Bodhisattva. That's very dangerous, you know, it's very bad karma if you get angry with the Bodhisattva, you go, you know, hell realm rebirth and all this. But then you don't know who's a Bodhisattva and who isn't, because it's those qualities don't appear to your eyesight, you know. Somebody may appear very loving and they may appear very kind and that probably means they are, a, you know, some sort of Bodhisattva. If you, if you know somebody like the Dalai Lama, you can sort of say, oh, well, he must be a Bodhisattva. But, you know, there can be many other Bodhisattvas that don't put on appearance like that. They, they, they appear in a much more ordinary way, whether deliberately or just, they're just being very humble or whatever. So, um, never get angry with anybody is a message then. Because you never know who is a bodhisattva and who isn't. It's very, you know, because of that, you don't get angry to with, with anybody. You don't say, "Oh, he's, he's, you know, just a lot of rubbish. He's a kind of, you know, fool who's, you know, treats me and and, and is sort of disparaging and, and kind of, you know, negative towards them." Because you never know. You never know the, the qualities of a person just by looking at their face, how they appear to your dim sight. Yeah. So that's that there. That one, that one goes in the number in the number three category too. So just some other explanations, which maybe not so unfamiliar, um, but the the text writer is trying to you know write, write for people who are you know trying to give them all the help he can. So newly incontrovertible knower being the meaning of valid cognition, uh, it is a mind that realizes this object newly or initially. For instance, the first moment of an eye conscious realizing pot. And then uh, the counterpart to that, nowhere realizing that which has already been realized is the meaning of subsequent cognizer. Okay, so that's sort of not unfamiliar. And what is that? That's posited as a consciousness realizing again by the power of previous cognition, uh, the very object already realized by that previous fellow cognition. For example, the second moment of an icon just realizing vase, for instance. <coughs> so he's realizing vase kind of through the power of um, having already realized it with the first moment. It's like just a continuation of that. It doesn't realize um, the vase kind of by its own power somehow, but it realizes on the strength of, what's, uh, of what the um, it's just realizing what what they and the, the previous moments already realized. Yeah, so those are the two. Um, those two also play a part in this reasoning. Just to remind you what the relationship is, is between them. So you'd have to have the valid cognizer first in the in the train of consciousness, and then the subsequent cognizer would come along, you know, as an effect of that valid cognizer. So if the valid cognizer is not there in the first place, how are you going to have a subsequent cognizer of that same object? So there you are. So the subject here in this place in front, with regard to a flesh eater, a person of whom a flesh eater is beyond their ken, 
does not develop a fight sleep on Gordon, the subsequent organizer ascertained the existence of a flesh eater because with regard to a flesh eater, a person of whom a flesh eater is beyond their ken does not observe a flesh eater with a valid organizer. So now if we use that as our kind of basis for our illustrations then, so now we want to give an illustration of two terms here. The first one, so to give illustrations using, for instance, the science that above, flesh eater is posited as the object designated, designated as a part of the Nagandam. So that's a key phrase in the definition, you see. So that does need explaining. That is a kind of probably a new phrase for people who've never come across uh, this reasoning before. They've heard of subsequent organizers, they've heard of other organizers, but have they heard us? of the object designated as a predicate of the Vivandam, or the object designated as a predicate of the Nagandam? Probably not, specialized. So that in this case is flesh eater. So it's not, it's not the predicate of the, of, of the Nagandam itself, but it's an object within the predicate of the Nagandam. And then just to finish off here, so a person of whom a flesh eater is beyond their ken, Developing a factually concordant subsequent organizer ascertaining the existence of flesh eater is posited as the predicate of the, of the Nagandam. So, if you just like to look at the sign again, so at the top of base 20, you see, um, the key thing here is. Um, uh, the object designated as the predicate of the, of the Nagandam in the proof of that by the sign of it is not suitable to appear to a valid cognizer of, uh, of the person for whom it has become the property of the subject in the proof of that on the flawless subject to be known uh, in the proof of that by the sign of it. So the predicate of the probandum or the, sorry, the predicate of the Nagandam itself is quite long. So the, it's just that the flesh eater is a key thing, you know, the key a key item within that longer predicate, predicate of the Nagandam. And what, if you had to just say what the predicate of the Nagandam is, well, basically that is um, the person uh, for whom flesh eater is beyond their kin, beyond their ken, developing a factually concordant subsequent cognizer ascertaining the existence of a flesh eater. So that's what's being negated, you see, that that person does develop or can develop uh, a subsequent cognizer of a flesh eater in the place in front. You know, well, in the place in front is the, is the subject, so that's not part of the predicate. So the, the predicate of the Nagandam then, you know, is like, uh, with respect to a flesh eater, a person for whom the flesh eater is beyond their ken, developing a factually concordant subsequent cognizer as attaining the, flesh of, uh, uh, the existence of a flesh eater. So that's what you're denying, see? Well, that's what you're proving is, is not possible. There, isn't, there can't be such a uh, subsequent cognizer. Yeah, so it's just, um, just trying to uh, make the terminology a bit you know, clear. So well, let's just finish off the ooh, let's just finish off these last two paragraphs and then we'll have to stop for tonight. So this is you know you can review these um, this sign in the light of these uh, last two paragraphs as well. With respect to the difference between the two, the object designated as the predicate of the, of the nagandam and the predicate uh, predicate of the nagandam. So that's just the two we've been contrasting in the last paragraph. The object designated as the predicate of the nagandam is the basis for identifying the, the predi predicate of the Nagandam. Well, the basis, just say the basis of the predicate of the Nagandam, you know, that, that's what it's all about, the flesh eater. And the predicate of the Nagandam is the opposite of the predicate of the Probandam. So there, you know, or that person for whom the flesh eater is super, super sensory, developing the subsequent organizer, realizing uh, flesh eater, so that's, you know, that's, that's what you're negating. And then last paragraph, if flesh eater, uh, it, sorry, it, it, but in this case, it means the flesh eater, the, the uh, predicate of the Nagandam, the object designated, sorry, the object designated as the predicate of the Nagandam, if whatever it is, is not suitable to appear 
to a valakinizer of the person for whom it does become the property of the subject and the proof of that. So the second it is the, is the sign, of course, yeah. So when that sign has become the property of the subject, it, flesh eater, um, so if it has become, if that sign has become the property of the subject and the proof of that, so there's a person for whom, you know, can, can realize that, his valakinizer, you know, if that um, object designated as the project of the Nagandam, the flesh eater, um, is um, not suitable to appear, on the flawless um, subject of the nine, and approve of that. So this expresses that a time when the person for whom that sign has become the property of the subject realizes the probandum relying on that sign, if flesh eater, the object designated as the predicate of the probandum, predicate of the nagandam, exists upon the flawless subject sort, sort to be known, that person cannot observe it by valid cognition as existent, and they cannot observe it as non existent. Uh, on 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 the floor of subject to be, uh, to be known either. The difference between non-observation for the non-appearing, non-observation for the suitable to appear. I just read this last bit quickly. So for the first one, non-appearing, it is on the one hand a correct non-observation sign, and also at the time when the correct opponent for that sign realizes the probandum. If the object designated as a predicate of the Nagandam exists upon the flawless subject sought to be known, it is not suitable to appear to their valid cognition as existent there. And if it does not exist, it is not suitable to, be, to, to, to appear to their valid cognition as non existent there. So that sign is a correct non observation sign appearing. But if it's the other way, if it's the other one, the one that we haven't studied yet, if it is on the one hand the correct non-observation sign, and also at the time when the correct uh, opponent for that sign realizes the Rabandam, if the object designated as a predicate of the Nagandam exists upon the flawless subject to be known, it is suitable to appear to the devil condition as existent there. And if it does not exist, it is not suitable. Sorry, if it is, does not exist, it is suitable uh, to appear to their valid cognition as non-existent. So then that sign is called a correct non-observation sign of the suitable to appear. So that's the difference. Very quickly, so you know, maybe that's you know it's too too much for you to take in right now because it's um all well, whole lot of words. But that if you go through that slowly, you might some pick up um, a bit more what uh, you know the sign is uh, uh, what the sign's like and uh, you know what differentiates it from the next group which we'll study uh, next time. And also there's a few divisions here, yeah. So, um, as I say, it's not the kind of the most important part of the book, but uh, it's there. So we, we're going to at, at least look at it, kind of, you know, kind of uh, give it a look over, see uh, if we can make any sense of it. Okay, then, well, it's about time to stop there. So... Uh, can I ask a question, Geshe-la, quickly? Certainly, certainly, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about these four points that we have. Yeah. But they sounds to me as I remember or may remember of the four non-affective obscuration for Sotrantika and Vaibhashika. And I wonder if that was by coincidence or they were the same. The four what? The four non-affective obscuration for Vaibhashikas and Sotrantika that they So where do you read about that? In the Four tenets, that tenets. Uh, you don't know about distance, not knowing about distance, about subtlety, about diversity, and about time, I think. Yeah. And I wonder if that was connected with these four, because that sounds a bit... Uh... Yeah, I don't remember so well what you're talking about, as if that didn't spring to mind immediately. But yeah, it, it would kind of be, it would be a non-afflictive obscuration here, because it's not... Um, it's not an obscuration where you would get off, get rid of just by removing the afflictions and uh, becoming a, a you know a foe destroyer in the hero vehicle. You've got rid of your afflictions, but you're not a Buddha, so you've got you still got obscurations, not due to your having uh, afflictions like uh, uh, grasping at a self or attachment or something. But afflictions which you know your path has not led you to be able to remove but if you became you know all the way to buddhahood 
mm. your extra power of purification and meditation or selflessness and so forth, then you get rid of these afflictions. Yeah, so that's a good tie-up, actually. But um, as I say, I didn't, didn't really remember that in tennis when I studied it. But yeah, non-afflictive observations, you can say. I guess that's, that's fair enough. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Any other question? Guess you that. Where does mind come into um, this? Is that um, when we're looking at the, the different types of things that weren't, but couldn't be uh, uh, observed? Mm. Do, how how does does mind fit into one of those categories? Well, I think in general, mind is a subtle phenomenon, isn't it? Yeah. But I think mind in general, you could say, it could be proved to exist. Or do we even need to prove it exists? You know, mind in general is a, is a for your own, in the sense of your own mind. Is isn't that a manifest phenomena to you? Do you need any convincing that you've got a mind? I mean, there might be some scientists or the behaviorists or some sort of school of scientists tried to deny that was only there was only behavior or something. No actual mind, you know. Yeah, yeah. Sort of material phenomena. Because I'm aware of it, I just can't see it or sort of a. It's other than that, can define as clear and knowing, but I can't put a shape to it or, anything, or uh, perceive it. No, but you've got some sort of direct cognitive consciousness of it, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. So you can say mind exists for me, my own mind exists. And the mind of other people you can maybe is only a, a sort of slightly hidden phenomena. Yeah. That they have got mind, you know, the way they behave and uh, you know, yeah. the way they behave just like me or something. You know, maybe you can sort of work out that they've got minds. Yeah. Uh, fairly we'd be fairly convinced of that. What about subtle levels of mind? But then, yeah, what exactly, what exactly, what, what state of mind they're in, you know, that's a different matter. Yeah. So they they just look like an ordinary person like me. So that means they can't possibly be a bodhisattva or something high on, sort of high on the path like that. What about the subtle levels of mind? Because obviously I'm aware of my gross mind, but obviously I'm not aware of the mind of clear light. Your own subtle mind. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. that would be, I think that would be one of these. Um, beyond your ken type of phenomena, yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, dislike the mind of somebody else. You don't can't see into them as somebody else's mind to know what they're thinking. Yeah. And your own subtler level of minds will be like that. Then you can't access them. Yeah. How would you actually prove they're there with proper reasoning? Again, you just kind of rely on the scriptures and sort of assume that the scriptures are. I was saying something true, yeah. which isn't, you know, it's not like a, a factual kind of inference, is it? No, no. Yeah. So that would be that would be a bit of a hidden phenomenon, a bit like beyond your ken, still a deeply hidden phenomenon, let's say. Yeah. So you can't work it out by your way of your own just ordinary uh, perception or inference. Yes, okay. We'll stop there for tonight then. Thank you, Kishtila. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll again next week. Yeah. But next week will be the old link, I think. You know, we'll go back to the old link because Jason will be here with us again sometime next week, I think. This is just a one off, yeah. Okay, good night then. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.